welcome back to Thrive, your go-to channel for transforming health, revolutionising indoor air quality and visionary environments. Today, we're coming to you live from the Thrive Linkage Symposium with a guest lecture from Alexander Mikzewski on airborne infection risk assessment tools and their applications during COVID-19 and beyond. Don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on our latest content and leave a comment below to share your thoughts. Introduction to the risk assessment tool uh, that our team developed uh, in 2020 um, in response to uh, the pandemic. And uh, I'll be talking about that more in detail. Um, with some perspectives on the evolution of the tools. Many of the tools were created during the pandemic and uh, a few towards future direction. What will these tools be used for in the future? What application, what else is needed? Um, so I'm including this chart because uh, for, for a number of reasons. Um, there was really an unprecedented problem question um, in 2020, which was the first time I think ever, and I'm speaking from reference in New York City because I was there in March 2020, um, there was a total lockdown. Everyone was um, at home, <laughs> not going into public buildings um, for an extended period of time. What? And so everyone was struggling with this question of what was the proper means of reoccupying these buildings, you know, um, how to do that safely. Um, should there be reduced occupancy? Should there be staggered schedules? All these sorts of questions that everyone was struggling with really for the first time ever um, with what was supposed to be a, a two week period of uh, being in one's apartment and then things would go back to normal. It was not going to be that way at all. Um, so also interested to see the transport people here because the slide shows that. COVID has not been kind to uh, traffic, but the New York City subway is, is about 80% of the COVID has been better. Um, but what I found, what people were doing, were taking these floor plans, saying, okay, this is where so-and-so used to sit, this is where we all sat, and drawing these circles um, within the space, um, one to two meters in, in uh, diameter, Say this is how we're going to do it. You know, everyone needs to be within one of these little circles, and then everything will be okay. And that will set the the occupant density because we can only have one person for each of these circles, and, and that's the plan. Um, so there's obviously some deficiencies with that we'll get to, but just in general, um, it's good to think about how we determine the appropriate number of people that should be in a given room, such as this room. Um, so we have the requirements of the space. So what, what is this room supposed to be used for? This is a conference room. It's supposed to be used for exactly what we're doing right now. Um, there's fire code considerations, right? Uh, it's actually a major uh, fire in New York City. Uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory led to standard protections for emergency egress during fire. So, you know, we only have so many people in here because we're supposed to be at that door um, in a certain amount of time. And then, uh, so, okay, so there's also um, how ventilation was previously viewed, which was termed acceptable air quality, so ventilation for acceptable air quality. So ASHRAE, the American uh, Association of HVAC Engineers, standard 62.1, standard for acceptable air quality, which is fundamentally based on body odor. That's where those standards came from some time ago was to make the air aesthetically feel good and to try to move the body. <laughs> now we have two other considerations. Okay, we have the social distancing, those circles that we're putting everywhere, um, which is presumably that short range, one and two meter droplet deposition range. But now we also have airborne transmission. So it's this new consideration with respect to the density of occupants in the room. <clears throat> And uh, through the help of Lydia, Giorgio, and team, we actually, with New York City Polar Buildings, were finally able to start people thinking about this, that it shouldn't just be these circles. We should also be considering the ventilation capacity of the space and help use that to inform the occupant density as we reoccupy our buildings. But how was that done? You know, it's easier said than done. So this was the real motivation for the tool. 
It was how to help facility managers, building managers, everyone decide was the appropriate occupancy for these buildings. It was a very specific need at the time that the tool was fulfilling. Um, so our tool, which we call the Airborne Infection Risk Calculator, we divided into two different, um, really it's two different <coughs> tools in the same tool. One, we term stationary exposure conditions, which is a probabilistic model. Um, so that is much more reflective of the spectrum of possibilities, the emission rate, uh, viral loads that vary over orders of magnitude. Um, and the solutions are solved for specific time periods because um, it's, it's much more complicated. But then it's, not, it's an analytical solution, not a numerical solution. We also included a numerical solution version on transitional exposure conditions, which address this problem of um, a non-constant source. So I'm talking here for 15, 20 minutes, say I'm expiring um, some virus laid aerosols, and then I leave, and those are lingering in the room. So this version of the tool allows that to be evaluated, which we were getting a lot of questions like, for example, in dentist office, you know, patient comes in, patient is treated, leaves, how long should that room be flushed before someone else can reoccupy? So that was the real goal of that specific model. So main two questions that this tool was intended to answer, the detection risk for different <laughs> exposure scenarios in that space, but that is very abstract. You know, so, okay, your, your infection risk is 3.8%. It's very hard for people to absorb that and use that you know, as an action when you get decision making. More useful, what we found was what's the number of occupants such that an infection would not be expected on the average. So in the majority of situations, statistically, you would not expect a secondary transmission with this ventilation rate, this activity, and this number of occupants in that room. So I'll just do a couple examples. This one's actually based on a number of uh, super spray events that occurred. Um, a lot of them were in gyms and fitness centers. Um, this one was particularly interesting because it was a Zumba teacher training session where a bunch of Zumba teachers came together to learn how to teach. The instructor of that was infected, infected number within that class, and then they all went back to their respective communities to, to teach classes. So it was an interesting epidemiological situation where you had a number of introductions of infected people into the same environment with the range of different outcomes. But basically, it's a small room. There was no um, medical ventilation, no mask use, high intensity, heavy breathing, uh, really a worst case, worst case scenario. Um, so this was the design of the tool, this Toradio shown. You can use multiple infected occupants, different exposure times. This is this, the SAC version, so it's the probabilistic approach. Um, it allows you to look at a number of different activities, light exercise, uh, resting, speaking loudly, all these emission rates coming from the paper that is original that makes it too. And then you can look at the risk in different exposure times as well as that occupancy. You see, in most of these cases, this Zumba class is not going to be a uh, good idea for a significant number of people. Um, and then there's also a sensitivity analysis function for the air exchange rate. Um, with that being the scenario in question here, there was just natural ventilation in these rooms. Um, now, what's really uh, useful about the SEC version of the tool is it shows the range of outcomes. This was something that was very confounding um, during the pandemic, was that most people would not infect anyone else. Some people would infect the entire room. So it created a... Uh, the paradox now people thought about it that how contagious is this um and when you look at the probabilistic approach the admission rate you can actually reflect that so you see here you get this kind of bathtub effect of um a frequent outcome would be no secondary cases but then also frequent outcome would be someone infected the entire room um and the tool helps look at that um, as far as what's the probability that anyone gets infected and then there's actually epidemiological definitions of what constitutes a super spread in that. So you can actually say, what is the probability that this becomes a super spread in that? In this case, that would be seven plus secondary cases. And you can see this is, this is really what happened with all these introductions from these Zumba teachers that went and taught their different classes being infected. Uh, the most frequent outcome was they didn't infect anybody, 
But then, you know, the, the next most frequent would be 27%, the majority of the room was infected. And the mean is somewhere in the middle there. And that's where this epidemiological term is called dispersion comes from. That the mean is actually not a very common outcome on its own. So this version of the tool allows you to see that and look at these more complicated outcomes. Um, the transitional exposure version, uh, this example is for a bus ride. There were a number of super spread events on buses. Um, what we wanted to look at with this, this situation was if someone left, someone comes on the bus and leaves, and there is residual um, emissions that are mixing on the bus and could expose someone else. Um, so the difference with this version of the tool is you can have someone in the room, in this case the bus is the room, for the entire duration. And you can have someone coming and going just for a half an hour window. So you can look at what the risk is for, for that individual. And then because it's a, a transient numerical solution, you can actually get the time series of concentration and risk um, and the concentration um, in, in this case in the bus cabin and how the occupancy changes over time. So this is for more dynamic situations where, again, you have these coming and going of both infected people and susceptible people. So we try to give people a lot of options <laughs> for scenarios that they want to look at. Um, so how did people, um, organizations, use the tool? Um, so I referenced a uh, time I was working for uh, New York City public buildings, and um, it was a factor in the reoccupancy. Um, it wasn't specifically cited uh, um, due to many potential reasons. Um, but the ventilation capacity of the space was used as an adjustment to this case, square footage per person. Um, in which case, the decision was made that buildings that had no mechanical ventilation were not going to be reoccupied. And that was a fundamental decision that was made. Um, and then windows where they were operable, it was very, very low density. And again, a lot of these are high-rise buildings, right? So you can open the window on the 30th floor, um, generally in uh, office buildings, but filtration and ventilation were considered in the reopening guideline, which was a major uh, step forward. This was actually an application for a nonprofit in the UK that was producing guidance for care homes. And similar to the previous example, the tool was deemed to be a little complicated for facility managers. So what they wanted was a table of different tool results um, that would say, that would inform how long people should be staying in certain rooms together. And in this case, some of these care homes, you know, the residents would congregate in rooms for 10 hours when they're watching TV, back, and many of them had no mechanical ventilation. So this, was, this table was really used as a guideline to you know, how long should we be staying in these rooms based on how big they are and their, and their ventilation capacity. And uh, right now we're working um, under review um, a paper with colleagues uh, here in Perth and in New Zealand illustrating different applications of the tool. Um, we can group these into different categories. One is room specific. So those were the scenarios I was just walking through where we're studying this room in detail, um, its geometry, its ventilation, what we're all doing um, to inform you know, the reoccupancy and then assess the ventilation capacity. There's also generalized applications where um, uh, colleague Mark Jeremy in, in New Zealand led study look at state schools that are naturally ventilated, create a prototypical classroom and use that to create generalized guidance. And then we also saw it being used as a companion calculator to more complex modeling. Um, for example, CFD being used to estimate the volume of inhaled particles, but then the tool was just used to calculate the risk that resulted from that. Um, so this is just a survey of, of how the tool was used. Um, as I referenced, uh, I believe our tool was, I can't remember whether it was first or second, with uh, Professor Jimenez's tool in Colorado, but they came around at the same time. And then soon thereafter, there was an explosion of tools. Of course, Robert School of Health has a tool. Uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology has a tool. Um, Cambridge has a tool. 
Um, this is the Tulip <laughs> World State University. This is a tool shop in Switzerland. Uh, Rima has not one, but two tools. And then uh, last but not least is the uh, interview tool from the World Health Organization. So there was explosion of interest in tools culminating in an area, which, which Giorgio referenced, um, which the hope is that um, one of these, in theory, it should be the area tool, becomes the standard. Um, and that's really what's needed is endorsement by public health authority um, that this is the important tool to use for various assessments. So it remains to be seen whether that will be the one. Uh, the tool is actually available now, um, but the, the documentation has not been published yet, hopefully next month. Um, as part of a presentation, I believe in uh, in Dorier and Finland, um, we presented a, a quick comparison of some of these tools. Um, this was actually for that bus scenario. Um, so in general, um, most of them yield similar results with some outliers. This, uh, the MIT uh, indoor safety guideline was really, um, really said no one should be getting on a bus at all. The risk estimation was much higher. Same with the safe air spaces tool. But by and large, the results were comparable other than those two outliers. Um, but further research is needed on that. We're currently working on a paper with um, a colleague at the Art University of Norway, who's doing a more precise comparison of tools as a calculator, trying to match exactly the same input parameters versus what I was showing on the previous slide was more trying to model the same concept, but not making sure that every single input parameter is exactly the same. Um, the documentation of the area tool is still under review. The comparison of the area tool will be included in that paper. Um, and just as a preview, um, the results by and large are pretty similar as what, what's being found in this, in this study. Those two tools referenced that had the outliers were not included because um, they weren't really considered to be apples and apples. Um, they were included in what I presented because if you were a user, any user anywhere who wanted to use the tool to simulate a certain purpose, you may use that, um, not really knowing how apples to apples these various tools are. But the big question is outside of this pandemic mode, um, this unique circumstance when the world stops, the intention is, is um, COVID-19 or whatever it is, who will use these tools and for what purpose? And uh, I don't think we really know the answer to that. Um, I'm not sure if people have heard of uh, ASHRAE Standard 241, but it was the uh, ultimate response of, of ASHRAE in the States to uh, promulgate guidance around ventilation during periods of um, high respiratory disease transmission. Um, it was not in, developed to be a guideline for all time, specifically it was referencing a pandemic mode of operation. Um, but nonetheless, it's still a uh, step in the right direction. But one of the areas of need of ASHRAE to report is, is a risk calculator is needed, of which there's plenty, um, that will support development of custom targets. So that seems to be the direction of the tool application are these custom situations. Um, and having a conversation earlier that Buildings may be designed a certain way for certain use, but years later, they're being used for an entirely different purpose. Changes are made in the building. All these sorts of things happen where, you know, as designed, it's no longer representative. Um, so I can certainly see a situation where tools are useful as these kind of ad hoc retrofits and changing uses are made uh, at the building scale. But I think that's still an open question that we're trying to figure out. And uh, hopefully the Area tool will be a good example case on will anyone use that for what purpose? So that's it. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Alex, again, you brought <laughs> different issues. And then that, that last question will anybody use the tool and for what purpose? That's something which has been entertaining us for a while, trying to get to the bottom. Were those tools used? At the, at, I was quite convinced that they were used, but not necessarily published. Because 
they are used for a purpose of doing something. It's not a research anymore. We're just using the dog tools, and that's why we don't have. Uh, a, 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 this, that's why the evidence for this uh, is um, something which we're still looking for. Um, so this is the tool um, will be used for the building design. And but then once the building is designed, what happens with the buildings? And we are reminding time by time, all the time, by all experts, that uh, the real world is different. And in this room, in this room, no one noticed that there was no ventilation until the button was <coughs> But uh, so this is the you notice. <laughs> Just now I was going to get up and do it. <laughs> when, when, when I entered, the door was open, there was a flow, it was that, but I don't, uh, I didn't bring uh, my CO2 meter, which would have told me. And then I was thinking, well, um, where Chantal went and uh, pressed the button. So this is the issue. It seems like this, I left to occupants remembering, and of course I'm not uh, well, we cannot expect that the visitors would know that the button should be pre pressed. But there are a number of QT people who lecture here, so we in principle should know and remember that the button should be pressed, but we don't. So things like this cannot be left to occupants, uh, uh, remember or not, and that's the role or standards for monitoring, if there was a monitoring here button will be turned automatically. So it's entirely different than nature of this problem. Uh, so they this didn't worry because the thing, there's no ventilation. No, I was sitting and thinking that the air conditioning not working. Maybe I should get up and press the button. <laughs> <laughs> so I was making I did it. So I was going to be really going all the way around. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to play? <laughs> um, uh, the uh, significant number of tools were developed um, in motivation to the COVID-19 pandemic, but there are other short-term instances of infection, you know, the seasonal flu and, and certain other things as well. To what extent might these tools be useful um, for those short-term situations, possibly um, I mean, just thinking of this university, we've had times when, uh, you know, quite a significant number of people have had seasonal flu. Um, is it feasible to use them then? And we might do something different for the one month period when that's happening? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think that's part of the rationale that ASHRAE 241 was putting forward. Pandemic mode, you know, could also be during a period of high circulation. You know, whether that's community surveillance is indicating a lot of activity or not, you know, wastewater is more commonly monitored. So those type of indicators could be used to make interventions, whether that's automated in BMS or building operators, facility managers need to make um, sort of on the fly adjustments. I think that's where the tool could be useful um, to inform, should we go to reduce occupancy? Uh, I guess just to... Perhaps I didn't quite word that sufficiently, but another part to consider would be um, the tools are very much based on some empirical and some scientific information about COVID-19's uh, mechanism of spread through the air. Um, to what extent is that comparable to seasonal flu and quite a range of other potential? So, so the things? other differentiator between our tool uh, was it, it did apply uh, the estimation approach that Giorgio uh, described to a suite of respiratory pathogens um, based on best available data. So things reflected in the risk, for example, the CCM influenza risk estimates would be much less um, through the risk calculator based on best available data on, on the airborne transmission. Um, so we did try to incorporate that with a view towards, okay, how do we make this useful after this acute emergency and apply that to other circulating uh, One of those tools, the Harvard School Health Tool, did try to incorporate um, fomite transmission, thermal contact, things like that, as one tool that would evaluate all those risks comprehensively. That was the only tool that took a shot at that. Okay, if I can add to this, well, the tool is, all the tools are based basically on the same principle, which is well thriving. Pretty much, yes. So, and the 
the mechanism with the spread is the same regardless of which infection it is. It is just the, uh, the what specific is or what, how much is emitted for this particular infection and what it does in terms of how much it affects. So, so really it is in the stores, it's changing specific parameters and then they would apply to uh, anything. But if I cannot, that's it, that, that question with, uh, whether they would be used and when they would be used. Uh, this was asked in relation to that science paper, but also there was a meeting yesterday, IBEC meeting that somebody from the CDC was, CDC, asked the question, what's the, what's the normal situation, whether or pandemic or epidemic situation, in terms of what we do in relation to infection transmission. And what I said then is that normal situation is that we should protect against infection transmission. Because right now we are not zero in the pandemic, but we don't know who in this room is infected and with what. So at all times, we should use methods to lower the infection transmission and the CTC plan. <laughs> uh, um, just thanks for the presentation. Excellent. I, I guess one of the uses of the tools could potentially be um, not necessarily a positive one from a government perspective in that it could be used as a, a factor in industrial disputes or, or a whole range of different issues. Mm -hmm. The element of the tool that puts cost onto payers, building owners, government providers, that, I guess you've got to get the pure science right, but the unintended consequences for some of this could be not pure actors doing other things with the data. So I guess you were talking about the broad costs associated with the the item. So you've got a risk, there's a cost of the, of the treatment. Uh, in pandemic, yes, you can spend anything. In non-pandemic times, how do you kind of show those benefits against the risk of an exposure which might give someone a, a mild headache versus you know, something nasty? Well, that's, I think that's where the epidemiological models and sort of uh, scaling these tools and pairing them with like SEIR models um, to look at the community benefits of these interventions and then do the cost benefit analysis with profits or whatever on these improvements. Like that's that sort of mash that needs to happen. It's like the room scale risk assessment models to the community models and costs and benefits. I can add to this. This is also the very uh, sort of focus of our work line of cost benefit analysis. So we are engaging with colleagues, economists, and uh, trying to define the scenario, what would be the cost, and the starting point will be looking at schools. So and, uh, new schools, so let's say if we uh, have a new school which is based, say, on displacement ventilation, what would be the cost of the schools? It will be a bit higher because the uh, roof will, uh, ceilings would have to be higher. So what would be the cost of this? What will be the benefit in terms of lowering infections and all kinds of things? There are, uh, well, there are cost benefit analysis here and there for different things. There was a uh, cost analysis uh, published by CSIRO uh, at uh, uh, 1998 or something like this. And, but this was not infection, it was in general indoor air quality and the cost of indoor air quality in Australia was then assessed as $1.2 billion a year. Okay? And that was without infection transmission. So our just kind of back of envelope assessment is that the ratio would be at least 1 to 10, but we need to calculate it. I didn't answer my question, Lydia, because I was thinking that too, that, you know, it's great to use the tool and identify risk, but then you have to weigh up the cost to the organisation of actually, like, what do they use that information for? So, you actually answer my question there. But I was thinking things like new builds for hospitals, aged care centres, et cetera, et cetera, that the tool would provide the evidence to support different ways of building and organising those buildings. If the sector is willing to cover the cost of fewer beds, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then, I mean, in theory, you know, there should be design standards and regulations, yeah. and building codes that would drive that. Mm. Where the tool really wouldn't be needed, the tool could inform development of those tools. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And yeah. that's where it's more of these custom applications where you're operating outside yeah. of the original design, where you're now back to what is going on in this room and how can we 
evaluates risks. Um, just one, one problem with the economics of this is, is who's paying and who's benefiting. It's very much like climate change, right? Where, where uh, the uh, entities paying are, are not immediately deriving the benefits, although it could be referenced as like lost sick time and workplace productivity. So you could sort of want it that way, but it's, it's still a challenge. Um, I'd say this is the biggest challenge. And it's not a bigger challenge that in relation, let's say, to clean uh, water. Because with clean water, if you drink contaminated water, let's say, from the tap, you get a problem with hours. And it's absolutely clear where it came from. So the cost effect is, is clear. And who is paying for, for this? Now, in this case, first of all, it's no one knows whether you were infected here or somewhere else. And if we are talking in general about the impact of indoor air quality, the impacts will be years later and again not related. So we are paying, so what's better paying less now or having those unspecified for individuals or for organizations benefit sometime later? That's one of the key issues. Are there any like additional practices? that aren't yet a part of your tool or all these tools that you'd like to be? And is that what kind of research would need to be done to be able to introduce these practices? So, um, good question. Um, first and foremost is on the inactivation rate. So right now it's just a uniform value used. Um, per, it could be adjusted for pathogen, but it's not dynamic based on CO2 concentration or humidity or anything like that. So that's certainly a uh, area of stock improvement. And then the key limitation is still it's based on this well-mixed room, which for many mechanically ventilated rooms is actually quite a um, good approximation. George, you referenced uh, his paper in the car cab, but it can be quite different. Um, so as uh, different ventilation regimes have become more standard, um, displacement ventilation was already on the rise for uh, energy efficiency purposes, how can tools reflect these non-wellness situations? So that's sort of the bigger question. Um, and maybe it's just that they're inherently conservative, so they can still be used, but if you're using a uh, more effective ventilation system that's removing and continuous the reading zone, you just know that your results are biased high. Um, or maybe there's methods to include other adjustments related to the ventilation effectiveness um, versus just the well mixture. Suppose you are also answering Wendy's question, uh, which is have any of the tools been used to compare different types of mechanical ventilation that is mixed versus displacement or mixed with different types of placements of uh, intake and exhaust effects? So no, um, but I think that's the future direction that's needed. And, and it could be an adjustment factor like ASHRAE 6.1 design gives you credit for different types of um, more effective ventilation systems that clear the breathing zone better than the things you're running. So yeah, there might be like an empirical adjustment that could be used where if you're using this instead of mixing ventilation, you know, empirically, the inhaled particle only drop by X percent, something like that. Thanks for joining us at Thrive. Remember to like and subscribe for more valuable content in the future and stay connected with us on our other social media platforms. Keep thriving with us and we'll see you next time.